All right, so we're going to get ready for our, our panel on glory, uh, excuse me, on global uh, sport and barriers to, to sport. And so. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to introduce this panel, um, breaking down global barriers to sport. And, and one of the things that we've uh, I've been trying to make sure you, everybody understands, we really do try to do the global picture and not just domestically. I mean, we, we've kind of uh, drilled down pretty deeply on things happening here in the U.S., uh, but quite a bit going on in, around the world. And this panel is going to focus a lot more on the access question, participation, uh, ways to to engage in things that, that have, have worked around the world or, or not in terms of that participation and thinking about different groups in that sense. So l let me introduce, uh, start off with our a moderator for this panel, Brian Brayboy. Um, he's the President's Professor of Indigenous Education and Justice at the School of Transformation at, at ASU, another one of those school names that you, know, you won't find anywhere, anywhere else. Uh, but, but one of the first uh, people I met on campus, a, a, a real leader here, um, and, and, and one that, that has uh, helped me quite a bit in, in understanding um, uh, the diverse communities in this part of the country. Uh, where I did not have, have great familiarity. Uh, participating on the panel, a uh, first, Maury Taharipur. She's the uh, former senior advisor for sport for development for USAID. Uh, she's also a, a faculty member at the Wharton School, specializes in negotiations. I can't mention a book that she has forthcoming pretty soon, but uh, you can put pressure on her. She'll maybe give you more information about that. Um, she was one of the, the people engaged in, in founding uh, what was the Wharton Sports Business Initiative at the Wharton School back in 2004, even though she's so youthful. Um, and, uh, but, but the important thing with the uh, USAID, uh, to, to think about her role going around the world and figuring out where um, uh, the, the $27 billion U.S. agency should provide funding. So think about that in the context of sport. Uh, next, we have Vera Lopez, who is a professor of justice and social inquiry at the School of Social Transformation at, at ASU. Um, she, she was one of our first uh, award recipients as we began the program. Uh, and as, you, as, as you'll, you'll hear from her, uh, a lot of her most recent work has focused on access to sport for girls especially Latina girls. And she has done a lot of work uh, across issues related in, in, to that area in terms of parents, drugs, juvenile justice, which one of her, her books focuses upon. Next, uh, we have Anastasia Komutova. How'd I do? Pretty good, okay. I've, I've been practicing, so I, and, and I'm gonna try not to say it again. Anastasia. <laughs> is a chartered psychologist and a lecturer at the University of Brighton in the UK. Uh, being a cross-cultural researcher in sports psychology and sociology, sociology, her research and applied practice focuses on the functioning of diverse teams and cultural teams. So think about that kind of issue in the global perspective. Um, and she's originally from uh, the Ukraine. Also on the panel, Daniel Bertsky. He is the assistant head of school um, the School for Sport and Service Management at the University of Brighton. Uh, he's a deputy research uh, deputy of research at the School of Sports Science and Service at the school. And his research focuses on race, ethnicity, and popular culture. And again, we're going to have some people talk about popular culture, but think about popular culture uh, in a different different culture. Uh, much of his work to date is focused on British Asian experiences in football, in, in soccer. So, so again, a, a whole different perspective and a way to think about that. Uh, you can start uh, sending your questions as soon as you want. Uh, Brian's gonna lead everybody up here and we'll get this panel underway. Can you hear me now? Yep. 
I was watching Ken take his glasses on and off, and I thought, I know that. Um, it's the ravages of, um, in his case, good looks, and in my case, age. Um, <clears throat> so thanks for being here. I, I'm going to just, uh, we're going to take about two minutes. Um, Professor Shropshire has done a great job of telling you all a bit about what we do, but I thought I'd just ask the panelists to say about two minutes about their work and what it means for um, barriers in sport and participation. So I'm going to actually start globally and then come back to Vera. So we'll start at the end with Mari, if you tell us a bit about your work. Sure. Um, so I was at USAID, and I'll, I'll focus on that because of where Ken started. Um, I w had the privilege of being the first sport for uh, development um, advisor at USAID, which was really interesting because what I realized was that um, everywhere else in the world, pretty much, there's a sports minister or a youth minister or education minister, and sort of sports is wrapped up in that. We don't have something like that in the US, and I was sort of informally kind of playing that role, um, which that's a whole other conversation about sort of opportunities that are abound, I think, in that area. But it was fascinating to me. I had never really done um, the work that I was interested in, which was really sort of tying sport to um, development, and by that I mean socioeconomic, uh, leadership development, life skills um, at a global level. So that was really my opportunity to, to learn, and it was incredibly eye-opening. And what I realized was that um, in a lot of places in the world, sports is, is seen as um, not such something like a leisurely activity of sorts, but it really is a platform for change. And um, though USAID had just created my position at that time, they had funded programs all over the world for over 50 years um, and used those programs as almost carrots for, for youth. Um, they couldn't get them into education programs, so they used sport as an opportunity to bring the kids into school and keep them in school. Um, it was an opportunity to look at peace building um, through, through sport, leadership development and life skills through sport. Um, healthcare was, is obvious and really sort of the, the value of sport in promoting better health. So, what I learned from that was really sort of the gravity of sport um, in driving social change and um, how fundamentally we look at it so differently in this country and the lessons that could be learned um, from those opportunities and the change that came about as, as a result of funding those programs. Um, where we could fund them, they changed lives, literally. They brought peace building to, to countries, post-war um, regions where you know programs like um, Peace and sport, fight for peace. I mean, there's so many of them. There's there's thousands of these grassroots sports organizations that that truly change not just the course of these children's lives, um, from bringing empowerment to girls, uh, bringing war-torn countries together, all the way to really looking at leadership development and and you know sports programs, basketball programs in Senegal, for example, and how these youth came back um, even after bringing coming to the U.S. Let's say to play basketball. Um, they went back to their country and at and really sort of high rates. And what they did was bring things like entrepreneurship opportunities. They started businesses. They contributed to society. So I, even though I believed in the power of sport, because that's what I had chosen to work with, and that's why I, I love sport for everything that I could do for society, I don't think I truly appreciated it until I was able to do it at a global level and really see how, how it could truly change the, the, the course of people's lives, but really at, at a sort of community level um, and the differences it made, so. Thank you. Um, Daniel, please, um, tell us a bit about your work and what it means around barriers. Yeah, thank you. Um, great to be here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I guess I win the competition for having aged the most since my institutional photo. Um, <laughs> I, I'm interested in, in work in English soccer and the, the barriers to particular communities of, of colour to participation in the, the EPL, the, the Men's English Premier League, and also what's known as the WSL, which is the Women's Super League um, equivalent. And for those of you who know anything about English soccer, particularly at the high level, you might be thinking, that's pretty diverse, um, there's lots of different um, international stars playing there, you know, are, are there problems? Well, you know, my answer to that is yes, there are. Um, you don't have to go far beyond the playing field to see exclusion 
in uh, coaching, administration, officials, um, in, in, the, in the stands, but also on the, on the playing fields as well. There are particular communities who are represented, but also those who are, are excluded. And, and my work in particular over the last 20 years has been about <coughs> British Asian communities in, in soccer. And about 10 years ago, I was giving a presentation in Atlanta, and I made the mistake of saying I do work on Asians and football. And within about a minute, I realized that not only did people have a different idea of football, but people also had a different conceptualization of communities who were regarded as, as Asian. So my work focuses on um, people of a South Asian background, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, uh, in the UK, who make up about three million uh, people, about 5% of the, of the population, but are massively underrepresented at elite level. Of about 92 men's teams, there's about three players uh, at the pro level of a British Asian background. 22 top level women's teams, there's about, actually only, only one. One. So my work is not only to look at those barriers, but also, I think importantly, to challenge and reject a lot of the orthodoxies which have been in place around the participation of these communities, which has been to um, attribute their absence to factors inherent to their own bodies and communities, their religion, their diet, their body size. And I've tried to flip that round and say, no, no, we've got to start holding the institutions to account and look at the governing bodies and look at the clubs and see how they're systemically um, excluding these communities. Thank you. Anastasia. Um, hello, everyone. So I come from um, a city in Ukraine called Donetsk, and we have this football team that for a very long time, or soccer team, Shakhtar, has been, um, they've always been second in the local league. And then at the, the end um, of the 1990s, our very rich owner decided to buy, I think there was around five or six Brazilian players, thinking that, you know, we're gonna, going to bring them to our team and we're going to win everything. It took us a couple more years to actually win something. And um, many people were quite angry. How come you, you spend so much money on those Brazilian players and they do so very well um, in the previous team and when they come to this new country, they just cannot perform at the level that is expected from them. So I was thinking about it for quite a while. Then I moved to the Czech Republic when I did my uh, master's and PhD in psychology, sports psychology. And um, I started to think more about what happens with those players who come from one country to another and they, they've been put under so much pressure to perform and they just cannot, for some reason, adapt to a new environment. <clears throat> And I couldn't get into the football or soccer because it's just very commercial, very closed. So I went to, um, to work with basketball teams and I collected my, um, my research that was in the Czech Republic, in Latvia, in Germany, and I interviewed several teams in there, basketball professional teams, coaches, local players, immigrated players who usually were from America, African-American players coming to Europe playing uh, basketball. So this is my research that looks at um, now the experience of, uh, experiences of black American players coming to Europe, being put under so much pressure regarding their performance, um, regarding their adaptation very quickly. No one really helps them how to adapt. Very often they come to a new country not even knowing where this country is in Europe. Very often this is the first time for them to be outside the United States, to be away from the family. Very often they don't know the language, they don't know how to buy food in the stores, no one really helps them with that. So this is what I'm looking at, trying to understand how can we help those players even before they go, they go abroad, and how we can help coaches and local players to accept those immigrated players and just pretty much just make it work for everyone. So this is what I do now. Terrific. So we've gone from global to the UK and, and the Premier League to the Czech Republic and the Ukraine and then um, back to the UK and we're going to go to Arizona with, with Vera Lopez. So we've Not so exotic. Okay. Well, maybe for you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so my background is in school psychology and I have expertise in youth development and prevention research. So 
With funding from the Global Sport Institute, I conducted focus groups with 78 7th through 9th grade Latina girls here in the Valley to find out about barriers to sports participation. Uh, Latina girls continue to be underrepresented in school sports relative to white girls, and that is a problem because we know for girls in particular, sports serves as a protective factor. It's associated with pro uh, emotional and social and physical benefits. There is very little research on how barriers are experienced by girls of color, even less on Latina girls in particular. So I was particularly excited uh, to be on this panel because I advocate taking a multi-level intersectional approach to life and to research. And so when I'm talking to girls or when I'm talking to people in the school, I'm not just looking at what are the individual barriers in terms of like confidence, but how are they related to interactions with peers, interactions with parents and schools and communities. So what types of messages are we getting at multiple levels and what types of interactions are influencing how girls experience barriers? A big part of my work is looking at how these barriers are racialized in class and gendered. So in terms of, of my work, for example, Latina girls, we often think about, okay, we're all alike. There's this pan-Latino culture. There is not. Uh, you know, we, we're very different in terms of different ethnicities, different generations. Even within, for example, Mexican origin groups, there is differences. So one of the findings that I have uh, uncovered is, for example, first generation Latina girls are reporting uh, more family type issues like with childcare and so forth, barriers related to their participation in sports. And so there is a, a nationality component that we need to dig deeper into. Fabulous. So you all, all, all four of you have talked a bit about barriers. I'm wondering what you think in terms of potential practices and policies that might get implemented um, to begin to address those. And you can go in whatever order you'd, you'd like. And then I'm going to start to dig a little bit into each of what you, you've said with some questions, and then we'll go to a question from the audience. What do we do about this? I, can, um, I think in this country, and I, I think... Uh, again, looking at sort of the global versus the national, I remember the, the, an article that was written in The Atlantic, um, I think in 2017, which is really looking at sports uh, domestically as, as, you know, the haves and the have-nots. And things like travel ball and AAU and, you know, all these sort of uh, barriers that have been built in our society um, that now disallow kids to participate just even at a recreational level. And so what cost, the, the, really the, the cost of even participating in sport is so high that it's created even a greater barrier for participation in, in communities that can't really afford um, to allow their kids to play sport. So, I think that's really devastating, and I think it'll be devastate us for generations to come. I won't even talk about things like um, access to sport for kids with disabilities. I mean, just two days ago, we looked at um, the Special Olympics potentially being cut in funding, and and you know, so I feel like sport is always almost the first to go with respect to funding and financing, and internationally, it's not really any different. Um, and again, looking at sort of the the benefits of sport. And not, not, I'm not talking about anything else, but just even, even play, right, recreationally. Um, there's so much benefit to it, and there's so much research behind this that I, I can't really understand why it's still one of the first things to go and, and how that really will, will impact the lives of these kids and, and really all our lives um, for years to come. So I think cost is, to, in my opinion, probably the highest of, of barriers to overcome. Right, and in the U.S., that's often talked about as pay to play, and, and soccer is. I'm I'm going to build on a comment from um, from Anthony Weston in the in the audience um, about the participation of what it means to play soccer. And as a soccer dad, I can tell you, I've 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 bought now in the last ten weeks ten round trip tickets to everywhere from Dallas and Philadelphia to. Um, Vegas and, and California for our kids, and I'm in a position where I can do that for them to be able to play. It's a huge barrier. I wonder, Vera, given your, um, your I know you're in the early stages of your work, but how much does this cost in the US um, factor into this? And then I'm gonna go overseas and, and come to you all in terms of that. 
So I'd like to echo that cost is as a prohibitive barrier. Schools are under resourced. It varies. I have interviewed uh, another part of my work is interviewing coaches. So from Title I to private schools and also in higher income. And when you hear the stories of coaches uh, digging into their own wallet to pay for shoes or having their budgets cut to a thousand dollars. It's, it's very difficult. Club sports, a lot of the girls that I've interviewed ha- cannot afford to participate in club sports. So even though they may have aspirations, I interviewed young one young Latina woman who wanted to uh, to be in the WNBA, and and but she doesn't not have the resources, the coaching, the the school, and so it really is the haves and the have-nots. And if you're in Phoenix and you need um, concrete evidence of that, go run down the canal between Brophy and Central, and you will see the haves and the have-nots literally across the canal because that's where their sports fields are on either end of that. So does that make it impossible? No. Is it an injustice? Yes, because we know that particularly for girls that sports can lead to positive outcomes. What should we do? We should develop scholar practitioner relationships. We should use our power and our privilege to advocate for funding sources that are collaborative where we go into communities and we work with schools and community uh, centers to provide access and opportunities to leverage the playing field. Pun intended. Thanks. And that begins, Anthony asked about, actually, about what can you do about costs. So we're going to come back to that. But I'm wondering, is pay to play and access to resources an issue overseas as well? Um, if I may just maybe talk a little bit about the cost as well, and maybe not uh, the resources uh, that much. For example, in my, in my experience, in my research, if you would like to help players to um, to adapt to a new country quicker and for a team to work better together, you need to have a sports psychologist in the team. And this is one of the professions as well that goes first when they cut the funds. Um, so many of the sports psychologists, that they don't only do sports psychology in a team, they can do another job so they can stay in a team regardless of the cuts. And this is where the problem the problem is that there is no, no much money to employ sports psychologists, and then um, many of the coaches still don't believe in such thing as sports psychology. They might perceive sports psychologists as people who interfere with their communication with the athletes, and this is where a lot of problem, uh, problems come from. And um, another problem as well is that um, People expect media and people and the coaches and uh, all, all those people who invested money into buying players, they expect results immediately. They do not give you any time to adapt, any time to get used to a new country, no help at all. You are a good that was brought to a new country to perform and to show your best. And there is no time or no understanding of that process of immigration that many of the players face. So again, cost. We, we just we keep talking about the cost, unfortunately. Right. Yes, um, it, it, it's been a real, real eye opener for me um, to learn about youth sports in in the US and the, and the costs associated with them. In the UK, I think it's quite different. Um, there are fees, obviously, which um, are accrued from participating in in youth soccer. But by the time you're uh, maybe in the ranks of a, of a professional club, you know, you, you're not paying um, to participate there. But what I think is interesting, and I'd, I'd like us to maybe think about um, issues not just around economic capital, but around cultural capital as well. And now, you know, th- back in the day, that the, the, there were stories of players becoming professional footballers, walking out of the inner cities kind of with their football boots, soccer boots tied around their necks, um, walking to training. That kind of story doesn't happen anymore. If you're going to become a a youth soccer player in the UK, you need to be um, in an academy, which you might be at four nights a week. Um, That's often some way away from um, particular urban areas. So it's very much about having a particular family structure, it's about having the resources, which would be to maybe drive you to, to an academy. So I think that's, for me, what's as interesting, if you like, as the finances. It's the changing issues around cultural capital and resources, which means that we are kind of seeing a changing demographic 
in, in recruitment of English soccer players um, towards a more sort of suburbanized demographic because of the, the resources which uh, facilitate that, that level of engagement as a young person. So a quick comment here. It's probably worth us paying attention a bit to this notion of cost. So sometimes we think it's about the economics of, of this, and there are moments certainly where it is. But there are other kinds of costs, I think, which have also come up, which are these cultural costs, but also what does it mean if you're in an academy, which is to pick up a child and to move them someplace far away, have them in residence, where the team then owns them. We've already talked to that. It's interesting the language that gets used here about players being bought and players being sold. I mean, it goes back to Mr. Roden's work, of, of course, if we think about this notion of the $40 million slave, and, and, and certainly with football and the EPL, that's $200 and $300 million um, buys and sells across, across Europe. So, um, but what does it mean to take someone, a young child at eight or 10, and move him across seas um, to be able to play with a notion that they must perform to get to the first team, which is that team in the EPL? Um, and what are the costs associated with, with that beyond the finances? Just a quick question that's come from the audience. Um, I think there's, there's something happening in, in the UK today or, or soon, a vote around Brexit. So if, what will happen in, in Europe if, um, if this goes through? I haven't seen the news, so maybe we already know. Right, yeah, so um, yeah, difficult, very difficult times. Um, in, in, in the UK, as um, I think Andreas said yesterday afternoon, that if Brexit had gone through today, we would be potentially facing um, you know, thousands of undocumented um, sports migrants in the UK. Um, Brexit is, is a really interesting sort of shadow um, around sport, British sport, at the moment. Um, particularly interesting, there was a lot of celebration in the... Uh, last summer of the England men's soccer team, which was um, heralded for its uh, multiracial background and was sort of held up as the team of the 48%, if you like. So that's the 48% who wanted to stay in the, in the European, European Union. My expertise is, is not sufficiently around um, legislation and, 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 and things like that. But what I would want to make very clear is that the, the time since the Brexit vote has facilitated and reinforced a particular culture of, of racial hatred in the UK. You know, days after the vote, there were stories of, of migrants, um, even citizens, you know, generations of citizens um, with different accents or looking differently being told, haven't you gone yet? So we need to be really mindful when we're talking about Brexit that it's not just a sort of constitutional, um, political, economic, which we often told it is. It's also about who has the right, who, who, who um, is a, a legitimate citizen of, of the nation. Um, and we need to be really mindful that it is validating and, and sort of reinforcing um, a really pernicious culture of, of racism um, in the UK. And it will be migrant players um, and, and players of color who will be the, the, further, the further victims of that. We continue to be reminded about the role of politics and sport. France won the, the World Cup. Most of those players are from African origins, even as they're implementing immigration policies, shutting those people out for the future. So they're really heralded in being that way. We've heard LeBron James told to, be sh to shut up and dribble. Um, in, in his work, and so it continues to go on. And, and I want to ask Maury a question that's coming a, a bit from the audience in terms of your work around, um, around the world, which is wh where have you seen kind of the, the harshest treatment of, of sport and, and, and players, and, and um, how's that going to be addressed in the future? How might we address it in the future? Um, that's a really good question. I can tell you where... Uh, we've seen you talked about sort of academies before, and, and um, I remember the work we were doing in the Dominican Republic, and um, the 
when I tell you that the education system there was poor, that's not even really, that's almost still a compliment at some point, like right? really sort of a broken education system. And um, when these young boys were sort of taken into these academies, um, they were basically not going through school either. So they've already started at, at very little and then they're put through these academies and still didn't have access to education. And not everybody makes it. So um, the majority of these boys then go back into society and um, so if you can sort of follow that trail, you're thinking about um, there's really no enhancement of them as individuals um, who can come back and contribute to society. So we would see things like that a lot. And so the work that we would do would be to not just try to improve the educational systems in the country, which is, a, which is difficult, um, but really trying to then embed um, educators into these academies so that uh, while they're there, they can also still improve as individuals. And I think that that's, um, again, depending on what kind of um, important society puts on its athletes, uh, I think we do really the same thing. We do them injustice. Again, we put so much pressure on these kids, increasingly so, that that's part of the reason why kids are dropping out of sports, because of sort of the, the frenzy and the, um, we even talked about coaching, which I think that's, really sort of at the heart of the, the challenges that these kids face. Um, I'll give you another example of, uh, there was a skating program that started in um, Afghanistan called Skatistan. And um, they were incredibly successful because in a country where, you know, the Taliban had basically driven all girls out of schools, uh, this program went in and at a very grassroots level started building relationships with the imams in the, in the communities. And so the best pictures of this organization that you're gonna see are these little girls on skateboards, you know, in hijabs. So they're in hijabs doing half pikes, which is like nothing more empowering. So you're thinking about these communities where, you know, again, they're war-torn. Um, here comes an opportunity through sport to allow them to grow fundamentally as individuals and empower them, but when it's not available to them, you know, a lot of these kids were selling their bodies, basically, these little girls, to support their families or, or out there working these horrible jobs to be able to, at the age of like seven or eight. So, you know, I wanna, there are challenges, but the benefits are so tremendous. The, the sort of the success stories are so incredible um, that when you do see them with not a whole lot of investment, what the, the change that results is, is quite incredible, actually. Little money, little investment, ton of change. So for all of you, and, and Vera, I'm gonna put you on, on notice. I'm gonna come back with a question specific for you, but for all four of you all, what do we do? Like wh what, are, what are one or two um, policies or ideas that we can do in the next decade to begin to address things um, like Maurice talked about, they can do that. I, I think everyone agrees that the benefits of sport is tremendous, but we also realize that budgets are often indicative of where our values lie. So even though we know that, Looking at, looking at budgets, it's pretty clear we don't value these things probably in the way that we should. So um, starting with Anastasia and, and sort of going across the stage, one or two things that we might do in the next 10 years to address some of the challenges and barriers we've talked about so far. I think education is the key in this case. Um, we just need to openly talk about what's going on and just, um, well, from my experience, just working with the culturally diverse teams and coaches and players, a lot of the, um, uh, the tension and racial abuse comes from the fact that those people never seen um, people from other racial backgrounds in their life. So they just don't know how to behave. And it, it's not an excuse, of course, for them, but that's an explanation of why that might happen. And just to address the question that was asked before about the harshest racial treatment in the countries. I would like to take a little bit of twist on it and um, talk about the harshest racial treatment, who it comes from. And in my research, it actually came from the coaches who are coaching those uh, black American players coming to their teams. And they were t talking about horrible stuff, about how you know we really need to have a black player in our team to increase marketing, to increase uh, people coming to our games. But we have to be very careful because we really don't like working with black players because they just come here to smoke weed, to go around the pubs, pick up girls, and they don't wanna train. They think they're the best. So we need to be very careful with those players. And this is what they talk about very openly. They don't even think it is wrong to say or think that. So I think education um, is, is the key in the first and the second and third step. 
Yeah, I'd like to make a, just a couple of, of brief examples or, or suggestions for kind of change. One which is more sort of attitudinal, and one which is perhaps more 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 practical. Some years ago, uh, a representative from what's known as the Football Association. Now, you might have seen the news that the Football Association in England. It's a bit of a peculiarity because it's just called the Football Association. It doesn't have to have English in front of it. Now that is changing. It will be called the English Football Association. But a representative came to me and said, um, can I talk to you about our approach for um, increasing the participation of British Asian players? I said, yeah, of course you can. He said, what would you do? Um, what would be a first step to engaging with British Asian communities? I said, you should talk to people and say, we, the FA, are culpable and at least partly responsible for your exclusion. And he kind of turned green and said, we can't do that. I said, why? He said, we can't do that. I said, OK. You know, if that's where your position is, that you won't recognize your contribution to this exclusion, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not starting from a good point. In terms of more practical solutions, I think, and I would be, you know, from, from the players I've spent time with in communities, they want to be included and scouted and to do things in, in the same way as others. We've kind of got to a stage now in English soccer where some clubs and institutions have sort of said, we don't know how to, to, to recruit you. We don't know how to work with you. We don't know how to do it through mainstream channels. So what we've seen at some clubs is the setting up of these sort of um, competitions and events, which are very much like a sort of um, American Idol, X Factor type thing, where just British Asian players are invited to come along and they can play. And the best player is promised a trial. The best player gets a trial and lo and behold, nothing happens. And for some that works, but for a lot of the players the same. We don't want this. We want you to come and work with us and scout us in the way you scout everyone else. To allow us to participate in the, in the more formal networks with everyone else. We don't want these, these competitions, these novelties. Please treat us like any other player and work with us in that way. So I'm going to come at this more from a health perspective. So what do we get from sports? Right. And we don't want to, you know, we can mix it up with physical activity, but just sports in, in and of itself implies physical activity. So how do we package that to families and youth and health? And so not just physical health, but also emotional health and mental health. And I think partly here in the U.S., when you're talking to kids, you're talking to parents, you're talking to stakeholders to give that message of why is this important? Why is playing sports important? And so I think as scholars and at the Global Sport Institute, we have the, the mechanisms to do that, to package this in a way for the community to make uh, this real, and also to get impact from the community on what they need uh, to help their families and kids, our families and kids, be more successful. So I think it really merges, as what I said earlier, the scientist-practitioner uh, collaboration. And when I say collaboration, I mean collaboration in the truest sense of the word, not experts and community members. Uh, and really listening and taking into account of how can we, we, we message this and contextualize it for different groups. So what works for some groups may not work the same for other groups. And, and that's hard work. But I think that's the challenge, and I think it's important to do it. Um, um, my easy answer would have been sort of democratizing sport and really sort of taking out this issue of cost and how it's a barrier to sport. But I think you know, just having everybody speak and, and the, the role of coaching, I think, can't be underestimated, especially as we're looking at um, sort of our increasingly disconnected world and really sort of how technology has played such a big role in, in changing the way we interact with one another. And coaches start taking an even more important role in, in how we have to better invest, I think, in coaches uh, because they're so pivotal, I think, to the development of these kids. Like the, the um, program we did with the MBA in Senegal, um, the question posed to us was why, why is this program focused on funding the training of coaches. Anybody can be a coach. And the truth is anybody can't be a coach. And um, when these kids grow up, and let's say they come from broken homes or divided families, or, or they see the really truly ugliness in their society, so whether it's a war-torn country or whether it's 
here in the US, um, these coaches start playing an even, even more important role. So really for us to look at them as being so important and making sure that they, they're, they're the place where the kids can go to when they do have mental health issues. Um, they're the people that they can go to to learn things like life lessons, that it's more than just the state of play and competition. Um, and I think that they can, they can be change makers, and I don't think we look at them as such enough um, or fund their proper training um, and look at them as in a way to, to sort of elevate um, the role of sports again in these communities. I think what's really important about all of these answers is how there's a call here to, for us to rethink structures and how structures work and, and people in them. So if you're asking coaches to help develop young people to be good, responsible, functioning adults, at the same time there's pressure because you've bought the club and you own the player to win, it's an interesting juxtaposition. And certainly there are examples where we see that happening that might in fact at some point be models. Uh, I wanna just pivot a bit because we've got a couple of, of questions from the audience for for Vera in terms of, of your work, and I'm gonna combine these two questions. Um, by the way, thank you all for, for sending the questions in. It, it certainly makes my job so much easier um, in terms of this, but are the, for Latinas, uh, um, in terms of thinking about sport, and for particularly first generation Latinas, are they the same for first generation Latinos? Um, and how do you begin to think about solving it? And what's the role of family in, in that? So I haven't um, done research with Latinos, but I can I can provide some um, conjecture on this issue. For the girls, I think we have to think about uh, conceptions of childhood, conceptions of girlhood. What does that mean? How is that classed? And how is that racialized? And how does that differ by context? So I think, um, and this could go for Latinos as well. For example, the role of work and the role of childhood. So if you have families that are coming that are immigrant families, which may rely on their children to help economically, whether it's um, selling flowers on the street to help uh, finance the family or if it's doing side jobs with dad or cleaning homes with mom. I mean, because all of these are sort of structured around childhood and labor, these kids may have a lot more responsibilities than the typical, like, quote unquote, uh, middle class uh, white kid in the suburbs because these kids are often counted on to do informal types of economic labor to help their family and this is and this is also includes kids that are also working in the fields as well we still have kids doing that in the US and so I think that's one conception. The other conception for first-gen kids is the idea of traditional. So there are a lot of stereotypes about Latinos because and again we're not all one group and we're, there's not one Latino culture but uh, growing you know Getting my, my bachelor's and PhD in, in the 90s, one of the conceptions that we heard, there were a lot of traditional stereotypes about Latinos. And what we're finding is those vary by groups. And so the girls who come from more immigrant families can be uh, more traditional in nature. And ideas about gender and femininity do come into play as barriers. So they may be expected to help out in the home. And finally, one other issue related to the first-gen kids is, is the parents are, are convinced that school is an avenue, academic achievement is an avenue for upward mobility, but not sports. So sports doesn't even come into the conversation. It can be seen as sort of a leisure activity. Thank you. I'm gonna ask you all to think about one or two things to leave us with, but before we go there, because we're on our five minute break, is to ask Anastasia a question that comes from Javier Wallace. How do black American players negotiate race and racism in transnational sport? Labor That's a very, very good question, and that probably will be something I, I will be thinking about for uh, the next paper. And just to be very brief, because we are on the five minutes warning, um, the thing is that for many of the black American players, for those of them who come to Europe, that journey and being in Europe is being perceived as a springboard back. So they, uh, back to hopefully for them to NBA. So they perceive that uh, the fact that they have to go to Europe as something that they must do in order to be picked and, and, go, and go back as soon as they, as they can. So they pr prefer maybe not even to, to communicate that much to, with the local environment um, who is predominantly white. So for them it's quite difficult to get into this very homogenous uh, environment that um, it's so obvious you're a foreigner. So they kind of shout down a lot 
and uh, try not to communicate with other people. And there is one of the problems that coaches refer to a lot is that, that black American players, they get into these little subgroups within the teams and they form it if there are more uh, black American players. They form these little subgroups and they only talk to each other, don't communicate with other people, which leads to a lot of tension with, um, with other teammates. But again, they perceive it as a job that they have to do and how they have to do it very good so the agents will will give them an offer from NBA and they can go back home. Thank you. So um, inspire us in 60 seconds with, with something that we should we should leave with. And I'm going to start um, with the professor at Wharton to... Um, I started. Why pull, can't pull somebody your else start? Put your <laughs> negotiation skills to fair. work and bring us home. I don't know. I mean, I it's, so having started the day with the great Bill Roden, uh, you know, it's sort of given me so much to think about. And, and um, there are days I wish I would wake up and, and we're not facing some of the things that we're facing in our society today, but it's here and it is the way it is. Um, so, you know, I hope that we can do a couple of things. I hope that we can look at our youth um, and think about their development in a way um, that will allow them to become sort of change agents in our communities. And um, sport may be one of those opportunities. Um, but, you know, yeah, I do teach negotiations, and part of what I talk about a lot is this development of sort of empathy and um, the human to human connection and the value of contact um, and understanding differences and, and how we just don't have time for those things anymore, that people, unlike us, we have no patience for anymore. And I think that that's Sport can actually, I mean, this may be a pretty big ask of, of sport, but I think it actually can play a pretty big role in, in these things because we need to find ways to connect with one another and we need to find ways that it's not based in competition necessarily, but finding ways to understand people that are different than us. And, and um, I think now more than ever, that's really important. And I think because sport brings people together in a way that other, other opportunities don't allow us to come together, I think this is, this is sort of the bigger calling for. So when we talk about, you know, funding sports programs and getting people, kids back into sort of recreational sports and getting outside and playing with one another, it's more than just the health benefits and, and the empowerment of these little kids, but it's really sort of about where is our future? And at the rate we're going, we, we need it, I think, terribly, so. Thank you. Sarah? Money. So I think money and something that we all can do, something that I do and I'm sure many of you do, is to donate to school organizations. You can get tax credits. You can specify, for example, that it can go to athletic programs. Girls on the Run, they're going to have, they're going to be here to represent it. Great program. Uh, the Global Sport Institute, I have an ask. They could provide some resources on the web with ways for youth organizations that directly, that, we, that you know where money will go to programs. Because in the trenches, in the fields, talking to coaches and they're, and they're trying to get used shoes for kids to run track, uh, we can do better than that as a society. So I think, and I challenge the, where's Ken? The Global Sport Institute right here, to be a part of that, to really put action into the world because we can do something. And we, we are in a privileged uh, space here. And so, and we have a responsibility because these are all of our children. I see Luke taking notes back there. Go ahead. Yes, I, th I think my, my points are related primarily to our knowledge of these issues and our, our study of them. Um, I think my first point, I would want to um, recognize the importance of, of thinking through um, intersectional analyses and, and the analyses of, of women of color to help us understand some of the issues we're facing, um, you know, it, particularly in, in English soccer. Um, one of the biggest problems, issues, scandals, if you like, in the last couple of years has been the experience of a particular uh, black woman player, uh, which I won't go into detail now, but can talk uh, maybe later. But that player has also been one of the most important radical voices um, in calling institutional racism to, to account in the, in the Football Association. So I'd like us to think that way. Um, and of course, that's not my idea. I'm reinforcing the ideas of, of others. Um, but I'd also like us to think about transferability. I think, if that's the right word. When I started doing research in this field, I was always quite anxious about talking about it outside the UK, particularly in the US. I thought it's about England, 
it's about soccer, it's about a particular community. But then I realized that actually, these are the same issues, it's like the same problems, these issues of power, exclusion, representation, voice, different sport, different country, different communities, but the same problems. And also, you know, let's be hopeful, the same possible responses and, 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 and pro progress we can make. So I think as an academic discipline, we can talk, I think we often sit in silos. We can maybe talk more across sports. I probably don't have 60 seconds anymore, do I? Oh. <laughs> um, I think just to probably summarize, um, previous panel, Renee said a great thing today about that we should stop really just talking about stuff and we need to do something. And I cannot agree more with that. And um, yeah, thank you very much for, for, for that. Um, so yes, the next step, instead of just talking about it, I think we do need, and I kept repeating myself, sorry for that, I need to focus on these educational workshops for everyone who is involved in um, in the sports, whether it is, in my case, uh, coaches who will be working with international players, local players who might might be might have might be having some troubles with other people coming from other countries, um, and immigrated players themselves. Um, we need to get them ready that they need to go to a new country and how. Um, uh, what they need to do there and how we can help them to make this transition very smooth. So I think that will be the next step. The four of you all humble me in the very best way. Thank you for your work, for your contributions, and please join me in thanking them. So let me, uh, let me thank our, our panelists and, and uh, thank all of you. It's, it is lunchtime. So, uh, and we're gonna head out to the rooftop that's really right here on the third floor uh, and, and lunches, box lunches will be provided. We really are looking forward to you networking and continuing the conversation. Um, you know, Bill took us to uh, the point where we reinforced that it's a difficult journey. Uh, we heard that there are some successes and we've heard that it's happening around the world. So we'll continue after lunch and be back in here at 12.30, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm.